This is the first set of notes for the Imperialism unit. We're going to have a couple sets for this unit because it's kind of a big unit. Remember, you can pause and stop the video at any point in time. You can rewind if you miss something. And make sure that you have the notes downloaded from Blackboard or you've gotten them from class if you are absent. All right, so think back to the Age of Exploration. What was happening? We had Europeans traveling across the Atlantic Ocean, okay, discovering the Western Hemisphere, North America and South America, and starting to colonize it. So the English start setting up colonies in North America, and the Spanish start settling up, settling colonies in South America. And so once they've kind of established this other side of the hemisphere, we start to look for, look at Africa and Asia as places to colonize. And so this is going to be imperialism. It's a new form of, if, if colonization was an old imperialism, the colonization of Africa and Asia is going to be the new form of imperialism. So a quick review. Um, nationalism is pride um, in one's country based on a common history and culture, or pride in your group of common history and culture. Um, a nation does not always have a government. Um, sometimes they do, and then it's a nation state. And then with industrialization, we had urbanization or the growth of factories. Um, especially as more factories were built, we had to form towns around these factories in order to have places for our workers to live. And we also saw an increase in, in production. Now, if we get an increase in production, it means that we need more raw materials. So both of these things from our review are going to help cause imperialism. So it's going to help with nationalism motivating nations to compete for colonies. Um, nationalism is kind of the my country is better than your country feeling, and so you want your country to be the best and have the biggest empire, so you're going to compete. And then they want raw materials and natural resources. So there's only a, a finite amount of natural resources in Europe, um, and some of the things they can't get. They can't grow cotton in Europe, and so once the American colonies split away, they need to find new places to grow cotton. And so then they're going to turn to Egypt and India. Um, likewise, they need more coal, so they're going to turn to like South Africa and Australia. Um, they're going to start looking for gold and diamonds and all that kind of stuff. So imperialism is the competition for colonies to increase the size of your empire. That is our basic definition. Um, and how they do this is they're going to use their economic, military, and political power to force um, the colonized countries or colonies to trade on European terms. So they're making sure that because they're stronger and Africa is weaker, the Africans don't have a choice but to pay higher prices than what the Europeans would pay, things like that. And then we're also going to see European manufactured goods flood the colonial markets. And this is going to replace all of those traditional and native economies. So the natives in Africa used to, uh, you know, subsistence farm, which means you farm just enough for your family and to sell a little bit to make a little money or barter in an economy system. And um, it's going to be replaced with you're now building, growing enough crops to make for these European factories and you buy your manufactured goods from Europe. So for example, the Africans are no longer making baskets themselves. They're selling the reeds or whatever you're using to Europe and then having to buy a basket that was made in Europe. That's, I think, the easiest example to understand. So we're going from the one grandma who is um, spinning thread by herself to the factory where we have lots of machines to spin thread for us. So who were the main imperial powers? We have many of them. Okay, it's going to be Great Britain, and you want to label them on the map. So Great Britain is the islands here, okay, including England, Wales, Scotland, and part of Ireland. We're going to have France down here in orange. We're going to have Spain over here in red. Germany is in green, number four. We know Italy, number five. We know Germany and Italy just united. So with imperialism, we're kind of looking at the time period from about 1830s on, so at the end of um, the Industrial Revolution. Number six is going to be Belgium. Number seven, Denmark, is up here the little purple thumb that's sticking out of Germany below Sweden and Norway. And number eight, Portugal is going to have some colonies. Russia is going to try to get into the game. They're not going to be as successful as everybody else. And then draw an arrow across the Atlantic to the United States. We are also going to, to want to get into the game later. So the first ones are going to be Britain, France, um, and Spain. And then eventually the rest of them are going to try and jump in and grab little pieces of the world as well to form more colonies. And then the United States kind of jumps in late to the game. So we've got a couple reasons for imperialism. Our first reason is going to be resources. 
Our empires need those materials and minerals for manufactured goods. For example, from Africa, they want copper and tin and gold and diamonds. They're going to use the tin to make cans out of. They started making cans for food out of lead, realized that the lead was leaching into food, and that's kind of a problem, so they're going to switch to tin, which is not as harmful to humans. The second reason they're going to... Um, motivation for imperialism is looking for new markets okay they're going to compete to sell products and search for new markets in Africa and Asia you know if China has so many people then hey we can sell a lot of products to those people and then the Africans because we're more powerful than them we can sell a lot of our products to them they also want to um, turn around and sell the diamonds and the golds that they find um, and all of those finished products our third reason is nationalism, that idea of we are better than you are. Um, armies are acquiring territory in Asia and Africa in order to grow the size of their empire and prove that they're the strongest. So we're going to have a lot of European do domination around the world. And then lastly, and kind of sometimes most importantly, although resources economically is kind of very important, um, but we have some social reasons as well, and this is what we call the civilizing mission. They want to spread religion, customs, and beliefs of the Europeans to the rest of the world. Um, so it's kind of this civilizing mission, as you can see the priest providing Christianity down here in the corner to our natives. Um, and they're going to use a couple things to do this. The first is social Darwinism. Um, where, you know, they look at skull shapes and they think that um, the social order is determined by the laws of natural selection, just like Darwin talked about how animals are um, formed by the laws of natural selection. And so because the, if you look at the Greek skull is a very different shape than the Creole Negro, which means that um, their, the Creole Negro skull is much closer to a young chimpanzee, which means that these white Greek Europeans coming out of the Roman and the Greek empires are so much more um, higher in the law of social order. So therefore they must be superior. So it's a very racist idea that they had proving why the whites are better than the um, black Africans or the Asians. Um, they're also going to use the idea of the white man's burden. This is going to come about with the idea of responsibility of white Europeans to care for and civilize the natives of their colonies. So we're tr they're trying to make sure that the colonists improve themselves and become better. Um, but it's not necessarily this idea that you're going to become as better as us. You can never do that because of your skin color idea, racist idea coming in there. But we're going to make you better than you are now. So we're going to provide you with education. We're going to convert you to Christianity. Um, and they're doing all of this through the idea of paternalism, where they rule the natives as if they're children. So because the natives are not as good as the Europeans, they're going to treat them like children and, oh, you don't know how to do this yet. It's okay. We'll teach you how to do this, that kind of thing. So it was a, it was a very racist idea of promoting how to um, civilize the natives and make them better. And so, but this was a big idea that um, we have to understand as part of a motivation for colonization of Africa and Asia. We kind of saw this with our gold glory in God. This would be the God part of that from our first imperialism, whereas things like glory would be nationalism, and then our resources and our markets would be um, gold. So we also have some different forms of imperialism that we need to know. Um, a colony is a direct rule by an imperial power where they are bringing in their own um, government to in this new colony. So England rules India and takes away the Indian government um, and replaces it with English officials who take a boat over. We also have what's called a protectorate where the countries keep their government but are influenced and protected by an imperial power. Um, Within a colony, we can have direct rule or we can have indirect rule. We'll look at that in class a little bit. But a protectorate, um, the it's not a colony. We haven't taken them over. So, for example, Spain protects Cuba, but they don't own Cuba. And Cuba still has their own government um, until the Spain are kicked out by the Americans and the Americans form a protectorate of Cuba. Our last form of imperialism is going to be called a sphere of influence, where the countries keep their government um, and they are a separate nation, but a separate country. But the imperial power has a exclusive trading rights. So Germany has trading rights in a city in China, but China still has their own government, even though they may be a weak government. So that's a sphere of influence. So you need to know the difference between these three um, and know an example of each. 
So if you look at, if we start talking about Africa, um, if we look at this map of Africa, we can kind of see how the, the, around 1850, the Europeans have come and started to um, colonize some areas. The Portuguese have part of East Africa. Um, Cape Colony is going to be Dutch and, and British. The Portuguese have part of West Africa, starting in Congo and Angola. The British, the Dutch, and the Danish are going to have part of the Gold Coast and the Ivory Coast, and then um, Sierra Leone and French have Senegal and Algeria, and then Egypt and Nubia and Abyssinia are kind of their own empires. Um, part of Egypt is controlled by the Ottomans at this point. So we're only on the edge, and so think back to your homework and the outline you did for your homework, because I know you did your homework. Why were the Europeans only able to be on the coast? Why were they unable to get into this unexplored area? We're going to have three main reasons, okay, and you want to write these down. Um, the first reason is because it's a jungle in this unexplored area. Okay, up north we have the Sahara Desert up here. Okay, we know there are some trade routes crossing those, the Trans-Sahara trade routes from, well, way back in September. Uh, but this unexplored area is mainly jungle, and it's very thick, dense jungle. So that's going to be number one is geography kind of coming into play. Number two reason is because in the jungle lives these little critters called mosquitoes, and mosquitoes carry malaria. And the Europeans are not immune to malaria, okay? They get sick very frequently, and until they discover what's called quinine, which is the drug that helps prevent malaria, they're going to have a hard time exploring into that area. The third reason is going to be because of transportation. A lot of the rivers, like the Congo River, you can only go so far on it before you reach a little waterfall. Um, what's called the fall line is very close to the coast. Think back to U.S. history, how Richmond is built on the fall line. You can still get a ship to Richmond, but you can't go any further inland. And so they're not going to be able to go on these waterways to get into the inside and explore easier. Um, they're not going to be building railroads into the interior for a long time. So that's those are the three reasons, geography, disease, and um, the rivers, navigable rivers, or lack of navigable rivers. You might want to make sure to write those down and remember from your homework. So how do we end up actually dividing Africa? Well, once they start with... Um, this map, and they have these little areas on the coast, we're going to see what we call the scramble for Africa, which is this fierce competition for colonies. And it's like we put a big cake in the middle of the table, and everybody sitting around the table is just grabbing whatever slices of cake they can get. They're essentially doing that with Africa, grabbing whatever colonies they can get. And so they end up having the Berlin Conference. Otto von Bismarck calls everybody together in Berlin and then says, we need to figure out a way to divide up Africa. And so they're going to actually draw, take a map of Africa and draw borders of it. Um, they want to prevent any wars from happening. There had been a couple wars between European nations. They want to regulate European colonization, who gets what, um, and trade so that we don't have fights. So the effects are almost all of Africa is colonized and they start developing those cash crop plantations which really change the native economies. So here's our map of Africa from 1884, our Berlin Congress. Um, you, can, you can kind of see how, okay, Belgian Congo is exactly the same shape it is today. Angola is for the most part the same shape it is today. Nigeria is the same shape it is today. Gold Coast, which is called Ivory Coast now. Um, Abyssinia is today's Ethiopia. Libya is a very similar shape to, to what it is today. And so they essentially divided it up. Who was not at the Berlin Conference? Any African representation. And so they just divided it up as Europeans how they chose to. So by 1914, Europeans had fought over and divided up all of the land and colonies in Africa. Um, for example, the Boer War, the Dutch and the English fought over South Africa and split it up. Eventually, the Dutch are not as strong and the English kick them out. And so one other thing that you can think about is um, this map on the left here is the tribal boundaries in Africa. And the map on the right is how the Europeans set it up. And so what's fair? What's not fair? How do they... How do they divide it up, and how does this cause problems today in Africa? So we're going to be talking about that a bit in class. We'll watch some videos about it, um, and in class we'll answer some thinking questions. What caused imperialism? What was unfair about the Berlin Conference, and why was it unfair? And how are the effects of imperialism visible today? That was fast. That's the end of the video, and that was a good 15 minutes. So feel free to rewind if you missed anything.